So what is hypothesis testing? What is it all about? Okay. Um, now, in the previous section, we've been looking at distribution. So we looked at the binomial distribution, the normal distribution, and those concepts are going to feed through into hypothesis testing. Okay. And we're going to use those models to um, perform a hypothesis test. So what's it all about? Well, let's think about it from a basic uh, situation just to start off with. Let's say you've got a coin. Um, and you're flipping this coin uh, and it could come up heads or tails and you want to determine uh, whether it is bias or not okay does it favor heads does it favor tails okay that's what you want to figure out now if you uh, flip this coin okay let's think about uh, just thinking about counting the number of times heads comes up okay now um, how many times would you have to flip the coin and heads to come up um, before you were then able to say are oh, the coin is definitely bias okay so just think about that for a moment um, how many times would uh, if I flip the coin three times and three heads came up uh, does that mean the coin is bias no Okay, it doesn't. You can get three heads in a row. That seems reasonable. Um, what if I flip the coin ten times and heads came up ten times? Is the coin bias? Maybe you start to feel a little bit suspicious. Okay, but it doesn't mean that it is bias. Okay, it just happened that ten heads came up. Remember, the probability of the heads coming up each time is independent of the next. Um, so you know, just like uh, when uh, at roulette, for example, if you play roulette, um, the probability, you know, the fact that uh, 10 reds have come up doesn't mean the next one's going to be a black, okay? So, you know, it's the same situation. So how about if I flip the coin 100 times and they all came up heads? Is the coin definitely biased now? Well, by this point, you probably are thinking, well, it probably is bias, okay? But I cannot say for certain if it definitely is because there is a chance that a fair coin could produce 100 heads in a row, okay? So hypothesis testing is all about setting up what you think is the case, okay? Uh, what you think is the current case. So that is what we call the null hypothesis. And we refer to it as H0. So the null hypothesis is like the devil's advocate position. Okay. And the devil's advocate position for the flipping of the coin would be to say that the probability is 0 0.5. Okay. Um, that would be the situation for the null hypothesis. And perhaps... Uh, what you're thinking about is an alternative hypothesis, which we refer to as H1. And the alternative hypothesis would say, well, actually, um, the probability of heads coming up is more than 0 0.5. OK, I think that the probability is greater than 0 0.5 for heads to appear. OK, it's got a greater chance of appearing than 0 0.5 um, because I think the coin is biased that way. So that is what we would test. So you'd perform your experiment, you go out, perform your experiment, you collect your data, okay, you flip the coin a hundred times and the pro and you've got heads every single time. So you've got a hundred heads, okay. Um, now at that point you've got to then think, right, have I done enough to convince myself and others that the coin is likely to be biased. Okay, so what this is doing is it's all about building evidence, building evidence for a case against the null hypothesis. Okay, so um, let's say instead of all of those hundred heads coming out. Uh, all those hundred flips of the coin coming out heads. Let's say you've done a um, hundred flips of the coin 
and um, you've actually found that 80 are heads. Okay, so what you'd probably want to do is you would set yourself um, a limit, okay, uh, where you would say, right, if um, I get more than this number of heads, uh, then I will call that a significant result, and so I would have evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, I'd have evidence to reject the null hypothesis to say that actually I've got evidence to say that that coin is biased. That's the idea. Okay, so this level at which we are setting this boundary we refer to as the significance level. Okay. Now the significance level is not something that you would set in the exam. Okay, you don't choose the significance level. The significance level will be chosen for you. But in practicality, if you were doing a hypothesis test in the real world, you would have to choose a significant uh, significance level that would be appropriate. Now, I'll give you an example of where that thought process might come in. Okay, let's say um, we were looking at. Um, planes and on the wing of a plane are these fixtures, these bolts, okay? And periodically uh, we have to test um, how strong those bolts are um, in order to check that the wings aren't going to fly off uh, when the plane is moving through the air. So you put together a test that will do that that will identify whether um, the bolt needs to be replaced or not, or the, uh, how strong the bolt now is, okay? Um, because obviously, as the plane is flying, it's gonna put stress on those bolts, on those fixtures, and the more times it's in the air and flying, uh, the weaker they will get, okay? So, if you set yourself a very high significance level, okay, um, what that would mean is that you would be setting yourself um, uh, ma and making it very difficult um, for you to test and, and then say that the bolt needs replacing, okay? Um, it would have to be incredibly weak in order for you to replace it, okay? That's what you would be saying. And what would happen then is that if you set your bar so high that it's very difficult for any of these bolts to pass it, then you would potentially be risking lives. Okay? So then you might think, right, okay, well, I don't want to risk lives, obviously. Okay? Um, so I want to reduce that significance level down. And let's say I reduce it quite a way down. Okay, so now um, it, it turns out that actually bolts, um, uh, it's quite easy to now pass that test. And subsequently, what's going to happen is the bolts that could be perfectly good for the wing um, will be failed on this test. And subsequently, what's going to happen then is that lots of bolts that were perfectly good, uh, and perfectly fine, will fail the test and uh, they will be replaced, costing the air company or the airline uh, or whoever owns the planes a lot of money in the process. So you've got this one here that uh, could cause uh, uh, problems with the plane, okay, and potentially then mortality problems against money problems. Okay, and then really you're, it's all about trying to find that balance, okay, beyond which you are happy with it. Now, it will seem, hypothesis testing will seem very woolly because um, even if, let's say, I'd set my barrier at my significance level at being at 75 heads, okay, so beyond 75 heads, um, I will say that the coin is biased and I get 80 heads. Now that doesn't mean, that still doesn't mean that the coin is biased. 
Okay, that's the important thing. It doesn't mean that the coin is definitely bias. It means that you have evidence to suggest that the coin could be bias towards heads. So notice how uh, I'm being very careful with my words not to um, be um, definitely saying it is one way or the other. Okay, so a hypothesis test, as I said, is all about building evidence, building evidence against or for a case in either direction. And what we're going to look at first is how we apply this to binomial situations, okay? Um, and the structure of the hypothesis test is very important, so you must make sure that you understand where all these pieces go and how to space out your answer.